Thank you for watching Now You See TV. This is your host, John Pounders. And if you're listening live, you have a treat for you. And if you were listening to this broadcast after the fact, it's a great show. And we're really happy to have Mark Sargent today. He is from enclosedworld.com. And if you check out his channel, he has a lot of um, stuff that you can see, the videos, interviews, his transcripts, and just amazing things that will have you just kind of wondering and questioning uh, your global earth theory and so to me it's it, to me it's really crazy because like you know my whole life I'm, I'm gr growing up with this globe and I see it and and it's just neat to me the whole NASA idea but but as I started seeing people question it like we had Rob Skiba on um, I, I think it was about a month ago maybe something like that and he started talking about this stuff and when he first started questioning I was like Rob what are you doing man you're just you're getting ready to, to lose it you know and then I started seeing what he was talking about and I was like this this does kind of make sense, and the fact that the fact that nobody has been able to debunk a lot of these things really have me thinking. And I'm still not 100% sold on the idea. I'm kind of a person that has to see it for myself type person, but it's just such such an interesting topic. And I and I got an email today that was somebody telling me that you know you you have guests on here and you don't ever put them to the test on stuff. And and I just want to let you guys know that's not my job. Okay, my I come here to to interview people so that they can um, tell us about their information. If I was going to have a debate, we'd have a debate on it, and we'd, have, we'd make sure it's that. I don't bring guests on here to corner them on any way. Um, people were telling me I should stay away from Rob Skiba, stay away from a lot of these people, but you know what? These people are my friends. These people are people that I respect highly. And um, so, you know, it's easy to just say, you know, these people were this or that. And a lot of times you hear from bad information such as somebody like, and, uh, you know, I don't like to put people's names out there a lot, but Michael Hoggard uh, is really irritating me lately. He's putting out a lot of fake information out uh, about the Hebrew Roots movement, about a lot of different people. So if you listen to that guy, I'm sorry if I'm isolating part of my audience, but um, he d he's, he's lying about a lot of the things he says. So I want to make sure you guys get that clear. And, I, you know, I'm sorry, that's just the truth of the matter. And um, I want to get that out there so I don't get a hundred different emails of people telling me that this about this person, this about this person. Worry about your walk and, and if you don't if you don't receive the information that you hear tonight or any other show, that's fine. We're not here to force anything down your throat. We're here to get the information out so that people can hear it. And um, tonight I have my host, uh, co-host John Hall with me. Uh, John, why don't you say hi and tell people about the conference coming up next weekend. What's up, everybody? I was looking forward to today's show with uh, Mark Sargent. Uh, we were excited in the house. We have a lot of questions for him today. Uh, but getting back to the uh, May 7th, May 8th conference in Evansville, uh, Evansville, Indiana, we've got Rob Skiba, Vigilant Christian, Gary Wayne, and David Carrico. It's a treat. Please come by. Check them out. You'll be edified by what they got to say. They're hardcore researchers. Uh, biblical scholars, and they won't stir you wrong. Uh, so come out, check it out. You'll get a lunch the first day, or is it the second day, John? They'll get a lunch. They'll get a lunch on the first day because the first day? on the first day it is uh, Shabbat, is Sabbath. So yeah. we don't want people to have to worry about trying to buy their food or anything like that. We'll have the food there supplied so that they can eat when they get there, and we'll have food that way they can kind of you know have finger foods throughout the day and stuff until later on that night. And so. It'll be actually at a uh, coffee shop where we're doing the thing. There's a venue inside of there, so there's also going to be, you know, a coffee shop available for treats later on and and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, they can go to yeah, they can go to nowucetv.org and register there. Uh, you can find uh, John on Facebook, me on Facebook, uh, John and Patricia Hall, and uh, find out for the information there. Tuesday. John, Tuesday, we've got Doug Hamp coming back for the Awakening. He's going to be doing Why I Left the Pre-Trib Rapture. It's going to be a great show. Hopefully, a lot of people will show up and ask a lot of questions. Yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting, to say the least. I, I'm still not sold on the pre-trib, post-trib, or any of that stuff. So, for me, it's going to be interesting to hear. Um, I'm, we're trying to host a pre-trib um, debate as well later on in June and uh, I think we got some people lined up for that because I you know I'm the kind of person that's like I have to hear it and really just kind of I just haven't heard any real good evidence for either one yet so I'm, I'm interested in hearing what Doug has to say I have uh, most respect for Doug and um, and even though we may not agree on everything that we teach I still have the utmost respect for him so well, we're looking forward to that for sure um, 
also want well, to make sure when you guys come to the conference, there's where it's going to be right downtown. So we're talking about you know tons of restaurants all around. Um, for those of you that like to play penny slots, which I'm not condoning, so don't be you know they have they have a casino down down the road. They have uh, there's a lot of cool stuff to do in the downtown area. So, but we're really looking forward to meeting you guys and uh, getting the chance to just talk to you. And we're gonna have question and answer segments from. Gary Wayne, Rob Skiba, David Carrico, Vigilant Christian, and it's just going to be an amazing time, and I'm super looking forward to it. I can't – sorry, somebody's calling me on here. <laughs> it's a chance for like-minded people to get together. Speaking of like-minded people, there were some flat-earth mixers going on, it looks like, last week, and I was trying to follow it. I was going to bring Mark on and see if he couldn't talk about those flat-earth mixers that, uh, that were happening. I saw that Patricia Steer was doing one. I saw that you ended up – going to a few. What, what was that like? That was amazing. Uh, and hi, guys. Thanks very much for having me, by yes. the way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the mixers were being held. Initially, it was Patricia's idea. She started the first one she was going to do down in Houston. And then another flat earther named Robin Poe had called me, and she goes, hey, since you're up in Seattle, maybe we should do a, one up in Seattle at the same time, because we were doing it on Earth Day. So we reclaimed it and you know called it Flat Earth Day, and so I put an invitation out there. And honestly, I didn't know how much response I get, you know, because I, I you know called the restaurant up. I said, you know what, book a book a table for eight, and let's see what happens. And then the RSVPs just started rolling in, and before we knew it, uh, we capped the room out at thirty, and I couldn't take anymore. We're turning people away. Uh, Patricia had twenty down in Houston at her thing at, at an Italian restaurant, and then. Uh, another group in Los Angeles last minute kind of did a, a group of eight down in Los Angeles, but it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, it put faces to uh, a lot of the names that I've been getting, you know, over over the months. And more than that, though, it solidified to a lot of people, which is why we started rolling out videos that. This is no joke, you know. It's in, and there's a lot of people saying, you know, are there people in my area? I get those emails all the time. Are there people in my area that I can meet with? And once we showed that, yeah, there's absolutely people out there, uh, it was incredible to watch. We had, just from mine in Seattle, we had two people come down from Canada, several from Oregon, several from Idaho, one from San Francisco, and that was just, you know, because we said, hey, we're going to meet up in, wasn't anything formal, just meet up in a, in a seafood restaurant down in Seattle. And, they, you know, they, quite a few people flew in for this. It was fantastic. Well, it's like getting like-minded people together. I mean, that's it's awesome. A lot of people out there that are doing the research are, are isolated, and they yeah. don't get to communicate with one another personally. So I guess it made it a more flavorable to see somebody face to face and be able to sit down, coffee, and discuss these things. Yeah, it gave it gave it certain it gave a certain concreteness to it, where it, it materialized. People were, were like, it, for a lot of people, it's still ethereal because if you don't have anyone to talk about it with, you know, a lot of people are really shy about talking to their families about it. What happens when you got there? When you see, it's like, hey, there's real people. I mean, the energy in the room was just incredible, and it just lasted all. You know, we ran. We were supposed to start at six, and there were people there way before five. There there were people there before I got there waiting. Um, we ran until like 9.30. We were basically some of the last people in the restaurant and uh, did a little after party afterwards. It was it was great. It, it just never stopped. I don't think I slept uh, 15 minutes that entire night. Very cool, man. I bet that was interesting. And yeah. I'm surprised as me how many flat earthers there are, man. I, I like I was I was blown away, man. <laughs> you know, I heard about it. I was I was so just tripped out by the idea of it and and like I just I look and like we did a show with Rob about it. there was like twenty thousand people that viewed it and yeah. I'm like are there really that many people interested? But now that I look at it, it's just so amazing. And if you would, Mark, just tell us a little bit about the stuff that you do right now, and then we'll get into oh, yeah. like some actual um, questions about about the stuff. So sure, sure. I started. I won't go into the prehistory of how I necessarily got into flat Earth, but I because I know it's a limited amount of time we got. But I created a series of videos. February of 2015, called Flat Earth Clues, which basically proposed that we were all, everybody here is living inside a Truman Show enclosed structure. And I just kind of put it to everybody. It was kind of a challenge to the internet. I made a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues, ran it, uh, the introduction, and then 12 clues. And I said, tell me how I'm wrong. And I, I laid it out. I go, here's why I think we are not living on a globe. Here is why I think we are living in really what amounts to uh, a building or um, uh, a god structure, you know, a, an enclosed system, and that which is why I called the the website enclosedworld.com, and I put it out there, 
didn't really think it was going to resonate much, to be honest, uh, because I thought I missed something. I mean, yeah, I had done a bunch of research beforehand, and I thought I had all my ducks in a row, put it out there, and they just held my breath and waited. And the emails and the phone calls just started coming in and coming in, and within the first month, I was doing interviews, and within another month after that, I had my own, my own radio show, and uh, my book just came out at the beginning of March this year, and it's just been crazy. Um, the numbers... Uh, and how things have been resonating, and all the weird stuff that's been happening, even in mainstream. I mean, we just watched a few months ago uh, the world's most prominent physicist, Neil deGrasse Tyson, get into a rap battle with a Grammy-nominated rapper over the flat Earth. How, how does this even, you know, it was getting surreal even for me, and I had been in this for a while. So that's what I started doing, and, and now, just to give you kind of a, a note on, on where the numbers are coming from, uh, when you, if you typed in flat earth into YouTube, just that term, you know, no quotes or anything, back in the beginning of 2015, yeah, maybe you get 40, 50,000 hits, maybe, you know, 50,000 relevant searches. You do the same thing now, you're about five and a half million, which is, uh, you know, 10,000% increase in, in a little over a year. It's, it's crazy the amount of resin. And, and anyone who does a flat earth video, Marty Leeds joked about that just recently where he's going, because you want to you want to jump into YouTube and get some hits quick. He goes build something flat Earth into it. It's it's amazingly hot. He he did a real quick. He did a video. His his biggest video up until he did a flat Earth video took him three years to get a hundred thousand hits. He puts out a flat Earth video. He gets two hundred thousand hits in a month, and it, just that fast. So it's it's been amazing to watch, even for someone who's been in it as long as I am, which has not been long. It's really, it's really cool. Uh, John, go ahead. I saw you're going to retire. I want to oh, let me plug the chat room real quick. Uh, people right. are starting to trickle in. If you guys want to go to the chat, we got a few people in there right now. If you go to the description in the video, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on Google Hangouts, go to the description and you guys can come and view or the chat and speak to us and and be available to ask questions later. So, you go ahead, John. Well, I was going to ask him if he had any projects coming up in, in his research over the flat earth. Is there anything new that you're going to be out doing? Um, what I've been focusing on mostly, and people that know me have been kind of following the Strange World show. You know, the Strange World show initially was talking to flat earthers and then going over various flat, flat earth related topics, but then the subject matter experts started coming to me. Uh, I didn't have to solicit a single one. They all started calling me because I, I put it out there. I said, look, all it's, in one of my clues, I said, look, it's going to take a whistleblower some, some, at some level before we get this thing going. If anyone wants to talk about this, anyone wants to confirm this, please give me a call. And the United States military people that have been calling me have been fantastic. Just, just to rattle off the subject matter experts I've done only in the last six months, uh, U.S. Navy missile instructor, uh, Air Force navigator, Marine Corps sniper instructor, Navy submarine chief, Army artillery radar officer, Australian intelligence officer, American flight instructor, industrial engineer, career surveyor, international shipping expert, career travel agent, air traffic controller, United States Army master gunner, um, aviation ground training combat expert, that's Army, USDA surveyor, uh, a 32nd degree Mason, which I just did last week and the one a couple days ago was an etheric science researcher. All these guys have come forward and they all say the same thing, which they say, look, there's something wrong. Whatever you think the world is, it is not that. It is something else. They, 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 now, they all would pretty much say, look, we don't know exactly what shape as far as the flatness goes, but they say, we can tell you for sure, though, it is not a globe. It is not moving. And everything that the science books are telling you are, are, are dead wrong. They're hiding, they're hiding the biggest thing ever. I think it's interesting, too, like when a sniper shoots... A gun, okay. When they shoot a gun, yep. there's there's something. I think it's called the Coriolis effect. You know, I I may be wrong. No, you got they, it. You got but it. But they have to plan for that. But for some reason, planes don't have to, and that doesn't make any sense to me. Do you? Can yep. you what do you, What do you think about that? I, I can elaborate on that because yeah, there you, you will find some YouTube videos where they say, oh yeah, we 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 will compensate for the Coriolis effect. And people don't know what the Coriolis effect means. That means the Earth spinning. Yeah, so you have to supposedly account for the Earth spin because the Earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour at the equator. If you're firing a bullet, the theory is that that bullet is going to be affected because it's it's not going to be the gravity is not going to have that much of a hold on it. You're going to have to adjust for that. And yet I've got a you know I read a statement that was given to me by a, um, a Marine Corps sniper instructor who had trained for three years. He goes, look, it's not in the manual. And everybody else, and that was just you know you're shooting what the snipers are out maybe a mile maybe. I know a lot about ballistics. 
And so it was great for me because I had artillery guys that were firing at uh, 30 miles, tank guys that weren't firing that long, uh, missile guys that were firing at 60 plus miles. They all said the same thing. They go, say, it doesn't matter what you're firing. You're, the Coriolis effect is not put into the firing solution. And your point, uh, John, about planes, you're, that's a, that's a br brilliant point, and that is a plane is just really just a slow-moving projectile. I mean, it's slower than a bullet, but not that much slower than a bullet. So why isn't doesn't it have to account? Why isn't the runway kind of shifting underneath it as it's coming in for a landing? And that never, ever happens. Uh, and, and I've talked to three different pilots on air about it. Um, uh, an American flight instructor... Uh, the aviation and ground trading combat expert and the um, Air Force navigator, and they all they all said the same thing. They said, "Look, the the pilots don't know. They they everyone's too busy. They all know. They when they go up there, they see the flat plane. All the gauges say it's all perfectly flat. But the last thing in your mind is, well, it can't be actually flat, right? I mean, it's got to curve eventually. We just can't see it. Right. And and so when someone will say, well, aren't all the pilots in on it? And and they also the same thing and say, no, none of the pilots are in on it because they they never would have thought of it. Everyone missed it because why why would you ever think that? It's can, it's the dumbest you, thing. Can you imagine a pilot saying to another pilot, I think the I think the Earth is flat. Oh yeah. He'd get laughed yeah, out huh? of the he'd get laughed out of the bar. If if you could, even if you even if you were so open minded as a pilot and you made that massive leap of faith, yeah, who are you gonna tell? <laughs> Your buddy, the FAA, your employer, you're done. As, which is why I joked in one of the clues. I said you would be better off telling them you had been chased down for two hours by a giant UFO. That no. would actually be easier to digest. One thing, one thing I wondered is because it, okay, if the the flat Earth model that I see, if okay, I, I noticed the flight patterns was a odd because I was trying to figure out ways that a normal person can test it. Somebody that has a pilot's license, mm -hmm. whatever, a flight from South America. Straight over to South Africa. Yep. You don't find flights that you can get that are straight over, even though it seems to be a really short pattern. The flights you get go all the way up into Europe and and then back around. Why is that? Because I mean, obviously, obviously, if the Earth is flat, I can see why, because that's a way longer distance than they give it credit for. Because that should be a one step one. It should be. The, the, everything, which yeah, what you just said there. That's how I caught into it. That was the intriguing little nugget that I that stuck in my head because this German guy was saying, he goes, look, he wasn't even really a flat earther. He was just saying, look, there's something wrong with the flight routes in the southern hemisphere. If you're flying anywhere from South America to Australia or Africa, basically anything below the equator to anything below in the equator, he goes, the routes are all wrong. They're all screwed up. He goes, they, they all go north and they go into weird directions. He's going, if you're flying from Rio de Janeiro to Sydney, why are you going through San Francisco or Dallas or Los Angeles? Why are you going up there? And it's like pick up people. No, no, it's pounds of fuel. That's the rule of, of the airline industry. But if you take it and put it on a flat map, it all lines up perfectly. And uh, and then when I was looking at that, and so yeah, what, what was interesting was about that was, and I made a video called the the long haul, which I said, look, it's very very hard to find nonstops in the southern hemisphere. You, you could you could say like Sydney to Rio, right? And you'd get maybe 50 flights, but 49 of them are going to be connections, and they're weird connections. They take 30, 40 hours to do, which it shouldn't be, you know, it should be only a 12-hour flight. And then every, people are coming back and they're going, yeah, but there is one nonstop, and and they kept hitting me with this one nonstop. It's like, well, that one nonstop obviously blows flat Earth out of the water. It's going, does it? So then I started staring at it, and that's when I found out that the GPS system doesn't even work. When it goes over water, that that really blew me away. It took me several days because I'm stubborn and somewhat of an idiot, and so I'm watching these planes blink. They're blinking off the screen when I'm going to get a drink or a sandwich, and I'm coming back and I was going, where'd the plane go? So I'd follow another plane, and they just keep blinking off. And then I realized that the GPS system, it's not just in the southern hemisphere either, which I didn't talk about in the uh, the clues. It's also in the northern hemisphere. So when you fly to Hawaii, if you're going like you know, as soon as you leave the California coast, you get about 150, 200 miles off, gone. That plane does not exist anymore. Oh, the graphic might be there. The graphic will show up, but if you look, you click on the details in any of the programs, you know, Flight Aware, Flight Tracker, or Flight Radar 24, it, the, the latitude and longitude will go to approximated or estimated mode. And my complaint was, and, you know, there's different stories, there's different people who try to explain it, saying, uh, it's like, well, if the GPS system has 32, 36 satellites that are, you know, flying all over this place, 
and it was designed by the Department of Defense, there should be blanket coverage. We don't do anything in the U.S. small. There should be blanket coverage everywhere. And not only is there not blanket coverage, there's these massive gaps which conveniently are in any large sections over water. It's, so it's, it's amazing. 500 years of, of we're in a, on a sphere. What are, what are your thoughts on why such a huge conspiracy? Why hide this? Why Why would we hide it, or why would the creator why, hide it? Well, not the creator, but why would uh, government powers? Uh, oh, we, got a, oh. we got a question. Like, well, before before you get into that, me, I got one more question about the flight thing. What's yeah. the website? I, and I can't remember what it was because I went there as well, the, the website where you can track every flight. Oh, what is that oh, website again? Take, take, take your pick. Um, there's Flight, Flight Aware, Flight Tracker, Plane Finder is a good one. That's the one I usually use, planefinder.net. But you can, I mean, it's they all base, they all pipe into the same system, which is the United States DOD system that went online supposedly in uh, 1995, which in reality is probably just the old Loran system with a different sticker on it, which is which is ground radar based. They just said it's like, oh no no, we've got satellites tracking now. It's like, Ooh, I don't think so. Anyway, uh, to your to your question, John, um, why would you hide it? There's several reasons. The 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 first one would be that if you don't hide it, if what I've learned about the authority, the people that run this place, not not God, I'm talking about you know just man, you know the the governments, the royals. I call them the authority, but it's really a group of of uh, the super rich, the royals, and uh, and government groups. If there's a risk of instability in our civilization, you know, even if 10% of the population freaked out about this and grabbed torches and pitchforks and started running through the streets burning things down, they're not going to do it. Think of the obvious things first. Uh, look at academia. I'll cover these real quick. There's three things you got to look at. Academia, you are going to lose the entire educational system from grade school all the way through college would be an upheaval. Um, there are certain departments that wouldn't even exist anymore, astrophysics, astronomy, and then anything that ends in an ology, geology, hydrology, archaeology, biology, those things have to be retooled to the next model, to a new, to a new model. So the academic world is in chaos. Uh, the second one is... Um, uh, financial, uh, it, there there would be a massive upheaval financially in the in the world, uh, uh, because the, you, you, there's too many questions. You know, stock market freaks out if some if a, if, a, if a president gets assassinated in another country. Imagine if all of a sudden the world it was like, oh yeah, by the way, the world isn't round anymore. This stock it, it would be financial chaos. Uh, but the biggest one would be spiritual which is, think of this, every religion in the world, the, the big five, which control 80% of the population in this world, um, be it um, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and of course Christianity, every one of those groups has been looking for a holy grail, you know, a, a magical artifact that, that solidifies their religion, whether it be the literal holy grail, or the Ark of the Covenant, the Spirit of Destiny, or whatever you want. If all of a sudden you were told that we were actually built, and by that built, this place was created, and if there's created, it's creator, well, then you've got basically the handprint of God potentially sitting right out there on the edge, and that's a tough pill to swallow, especially for science. Science does not like God questions. They don't. We've seen it with evolution. We've seen it with the Big Bang. Uh, if all of a sudden science has to come in, and it's unfortunate because they were the ones that discovered this, in my opinion, back in the late 50s. If science finds something that goes against science, they are not going to tell you. Plain and simple. Um, the Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark argument, which is, uh, you know, everyone was fighting the entire movie over the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. What happens when you get to the last minute of the movie? They put it in a crate, and they put it in a warehouse, and no one ever, ever gets to see it because it goes against science. It raises questions which science doesn't know how to answer. You take those three things, you know, educational, financial, and spiritual, you put, you know, and, and put that to a group of guys, high-powered guys in a meeting room, that meeting takes about 10 minutes, tops. And they said, we got to hold on to this thing for as long as we can, so what's it going to take to hide it? Money. That's all it's going to take. Money and being clever, do not tell that many people, seal off the outer edge and the upper edge, and they did it very, very well. Their big moves, I mean, everything got so weird after the 1950s. The Antarctic Treaty in 1959, locking down Antarctica for all time. Um, creating the, you know, inventing the Van Allen radiation belts and saying that they're up there. Um, creating NASA in 1958. 
you know, which basically militarized space and kept the private corporations out for decades. And only now, only now, are they even coming, you know, anywhere close to it. And I'm sure those private corporations, you know, SpaceX and Virgin Galactic, they're probably tied in at this point. Uh, but it is, yeah, it's the greatest deception of all time. It's the coolest deception of all time. And uh, it's it's a wonder to see. I knew I learn new stuff every week. Talk about the Ponzi scheme behind NASA, you know, and I mean, they have billions of billions of dollars dumped into this. Oh, yeah, 20, 20, 20 billion last year was wow. their budget. Yeah, and, and they and they keep year, yeah. and they keep kicking the can down the road. They're, we're paying twenty billion for th for things, but they're killing programs. Most people don't even know we don't even have a space shuttle program anymore. That's gone. Uh, they keep talking about Mars. No one's been to the moon supposedly since nineteen seventy two. That's two generations of people that that have no idea. You know, there's no no nobody's. Really, they keep talking about Mars, the uh, the Orion project. Keep, keep kicking that can down the road. That's never, ever going to happen. Um, for And I talked about this in several things where you can't, unfortunately, the detection ability, and I don't want to nerd this conversation too much, but we all, you know, if you make a movie, you're going to make mistakes because every movie is filmed out of sequence, which is why, you know, the news for the most part isn't, but we get into that later. So if you have websites that are dedicated to it, if you make a mistake in your movie, it will be on the internet. It's called moviemistakes.com or the very, you know the other clones of that. You couldn't fake a Mars mission now if you wanted to because the detection ability of the internet, they would just dissect it and they would discover it in, in record time, which is why they're stalling as long as they have. It's like, oh yeah, we'll get to Mars. That's what you keep hearing. We'll go to Mars. We're going to Mars. Everybody, get the money together. We're going to Mars. They're not going anywhere. They can't. If I was given... And I'm a pretty creative guy. If I was given a dump truck full of money and the best Hollywood people in the world, I would still say no. It's like, I, there's no way you can do it. You can't fake anything anymore, which is why all the, the local stuff, we don't have to get into those, is so hard to fake because the, the technology is caught up. Um, between HD and everybody with their phones and the internet, everybody swapping stuff and all the forms, all it takes is one guy in the middle of Kansas, 4 o'clock in the morning, to spot one frame and then that's it. It's on the internet, and you're doomed. Sorry, that's uh, my rant. You, no, YouTube is blown up with debunking NASA. I mean, it's all over. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rob had a, a, a short video out. He was talking about the Van Allen belts, and a lady talking about doing water suits and how much they were going to cost. And, I mean, he was just going off and on, on a rant on that, and just people started making videos just on that one subject. I mean, you can find out how much money they're going to spend on it, and it's not going to work. Yeah. I mean, they're just debunking it left and right. So. Oh, I I love watching what you what you said there because the the flat Earth movement what it's done is it's taken a whole other level of people, and they're they're going backwards and they're analyzing every frame that NASA's ever released, <laughs> and now they're just they're just ripping stuff apart. You know, we we even every week we get stuff from like six and seven years ago, and they're saying, well, look at this. You know, uh, they they'll find it, and it's blatant. They're horrible, horrible effects, and I feel bad because they used to be able to get away with it, and now they now they're not. It's it's the, the especially the interior ISS stuff. It's just horrible, horrible production. I, it, I, I would, if I was in a Hollywood back lot and I got, you know, that was my dailies watching the, the interior ISS shot, oh, the heads would roll. Too bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there were several, there's several questions in the chat, but I'm going to hold those just for a second, guys, and if I forget to ask them, re-ask the question, copy your question, because I want to ask, a, okay, so we're talking about planets, we're talking about Mars, we're talking about stars. Mm-hmm. Okay, how does this work into the flat Earth plan? And and I've seen I've seen a couple of different uh, uh, flat Earth models where the sun kind of goes in a round circle yeah. around like a you know a, a circular pattern around the Earth, which I can understand that. But yeah. what about the stars and these planets that are um, you know how far away are they? What what is going on, man? The orbit pattern and all that. <laughs> what how does that change if the Earth is flat? If it's if it's flat, what it does is it really doesn't change it that much as far as the how it moves through the sky, what really changes is the distance. So, and I know I'm going to date myself by saying this. Look, you to really appreciate, you got to go to a planetarium just to see what I'm talking about. If anyone who doesn't know what a planetarium is, I don't know if they take kids there anymore, but it's a giant dome structure where you lay on your back in these seats and you watch all the stars and everything go across the sky. And you know the moon. If it's a really good planetarium, maybe they'll throw in the sun. But it's all pre-programmed and everything just moves across the sky. And what I'm getting at is. The stars are moving, not you. 
So the question is, and some people will say, well, you know, I've seen Jupiter and I've seen Mars with a telescope. And I go, fine, take your pair of binoculars, go into a planetarium, look at Jupiter, and tell me, do the binoculars make it seem more real or less real? And it's a trick question. It's like, well, it doesn't make any difference because you know you're in a planetarium, you know it's fake. Then I propose, it's like, okay, how do you know you're not in a much, much bigger one? Because, and that, that was really what I proposed, which was if you can make a structure, basically it's a giant planetarium slash terrarium slash arboretum slash wildlife preserve, whatever. But if you can make something that's thousands of miles wide and several thousand miles high, can you fool an entire civilization to think they're actually, you know, think they're actually in space? And yeah, you can. Um, how far are the stars? If, you know, the dome could be as little as 400 miles high and several thousand miles high. What makes it different, though, in my opinion, is uh, the most of it is planetarium-like, like we would build a planetarium, but the sun and the moon appear to be different. They appear to be solid objects, whether they're two-dimensional or three-dimensional, we don't know, uh, but they are roughly about the same size, several thousand miles up, maybe 3,000 miles up, and they're both uh, between 30 and 40 miles wide, one, and they're both completely illuminated, self-illuminated. The moon isn't reflecting anything off the sun. Uh, one is a big light bulb, the other is a big night light. And they're spinning around, and they are suspended by something that we, you know, a technology we don't know. Um, does this mean the stars aren't real? Uh, no, I mean, there are lights in the skies. Are, do they have sentience? Do they have conscience? I don't know. But, but, they're, but they're not what you think they are. They're definitely not light years or even light minutes away. They're right there. So, uh, so, so you think they're inside of the for a minute? They're not I, I do. It. I do. I'll go. I'll go scriptural on that one. Where and I can't remember chapter and verse. Rob Skiba would be way better than me. Where that the, that the stars were placed in the firmament would not surprise me. Uh, I mean, even that's probably an interpretation. I mean, if you in a, in a, if you ask somebody from olden times, in, go into a planetarium and you turn on the projector, and you you know you see the stars up there. Technically, they're in the dome, but they're actually on the dome as well. It's it's hard hard to describe. Um, but another thing, because people will say, well, that's hard to do. That's really, really hard, and, and it, they can't get their head around it. I was going, look, I'm old enough to remember when you used to go into Planetarium on the weekends and watch Laser Pink Floyd or Laser Zeppelin, where it basically used the same system but turned off all the stars and projected all this weird stuff that's up there. And people forget. It's like no, they were using the same system. You could project anything you wanted. So when people say... Well, how does the how do you get a crescent shape on the moon? How do you get the phases of the moon? Are you kidding? You can do anything up there you want. I mean, blood moon that's easy. Just tell you, turn moon red. You know, at this particular time, it's not hard. the The upper part is is a is a snap compared to what's down here. The tough part that that is is everything on the ground. Those systems are way more complex than than what's up up there. Up there is just a light show. Well, talking about the laser light show, I've been seeing a lot of uh, on. Uh YouTube about dual suns, two suns. Have you been, have you looked into that, that at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that kind of ties into the whole Enoch thing, which I, just, I never, you know, when this thing first started um, uh, beginning of 2015, I never would have thought that the Book of Enoch would have would have risen to such prominence. <laughs> but it really has. Uh, those who don't know what the Book of Enoch is, it's a non-canonized book of the Bible, uh, which is very, very interesting. It really is kind of a, uh, uh, blueprint for how the the world works, basically. You know, getting down to you know the sun, how the sun would come in and out of portals, and the moon would come in and out of portals, and then you can start the question: Okay, is there more than one sun? Is there more than one object going around? Uh, because it, you know, if if you're doing a display system and you want to simulate, you know, the stars spinning in one direction and stars spinning in another direction. You're going to have to have two sets of stars, plain and simple. Uh, you know, which is what we've been doing in software for at least the last 15 years. When we when we create simulations, it's called instancing, which is you create a view based on your region. So if you're in Texas, you see, you know, the, the belt of Orion is made out of green stars. Up here in Seattle, they could be made out of red stars. I'm, what I'm saying is, it's easy to do because you just say, if Texas green, if in Seattle red, if that's how I did that. Anyway, yeah, the, the multiple sun thing, yeah, very possible. There's some weird, weird stuff up. We, there's a lot in the sky that we're still trying to figure out. Now, what about these pictures of the people who are, because the, they have big telescopes now that are, I mean, yep. massive telescopes. Yep. Okay, I, and there's an obvious there's an obvious distance difference between stars, at least from what I, I and, and of course I haven't tested this, and maybe you have, but it seems to be an obvious distance between certain stars 
and other stars, and there seems to be cluster stars and different things like that. What is, what is your um, research say on this stuff? Uh, well, when it comes to stars, there's a, there's a couple things. I'll, I'll go both pro and con. Uh, when, when it comes to the stars, I believe the stars are also, not only are they projected up there, but I think they're projected in layers. Much like, a, um, uh, in fact, I'll use something that I read off one of my show things recently, which it appears to have resolution that is tied to depth. So if you're zooming, again, the tough part is I don't want to give NASA too much credit because the people that take those really, really deep pictures, it all circles back to the same group, which is tied to NASA. Even NASA will tell you that the, the, the wonderful pictures that you get of all the galaxies and all the fun nebulas and all that stuff, they will say, oh, no, it's translated from black and white data, which was translated from a radio telescope, which is translated from all this other stuff. I do not believe, I'm not trying to be necessarily harsh, but, you know, NASA is my enemy at this point, that, that NASA, the only reason NASA was created was to help hide the world you're in, and that everything they have done, everything from 1958 until now, has been absolutely uh, made up. It has just been a, a joke. But... To that end, let me let me mention one other thing here because this will tie in with the stars. Something that people have been bringing up recently, which is the lack of parallax scrolling when it comes to stars. So that, like you said, if there's close stars and there's far away stars, and we are traveling, our galaxy is traveling through the cosmos at half a million miles an hour or even faster, or millions of miles an hour, eventually, sooner or later, you're going to get parallax scrolling, which means like you're driving by in a car, the telephone poles right next to you are moving really, really fast, but the mountains in the distance are moving really, really slow. None of the stars are shifting. None of the stars are moving. They're not ever getting out of perspective. And people saying, well, the distances are so far that that's never, ever going to happen. I'm just going, I don't know if I buy that because the constellations are still there from thousands of years ago. You know, the, you know, the whatever constellation you're, you're going to think of, that constellation pattern hasn't changed. It's still, the drawings are still there, which means no parallax scrolling has ever happened. One one thing that I've I've heard said before is that uh, Ryan's belt, when it lines up with the pyramids, that uh, there's a there's a de certain amount of degrees that's off now compared mm -hmm. to how it used to be. But I don't know. I, have you researched that any or not? I I have not. Everybody that um that I've talked to or watched or read has said the same thing, and they're saying there's no real evidence of any parallax because it should be everywhere simultaneously. Right, right. I mean, if you get a, if you get a star that's 12 light years light years away and one that's 500 light years away, and those aren't, you know, those. that's a pretty big distance, even though they're fairly close. You're going to see something eventually. People keep forgetting that, yeah, the Earth spins at 1,000 miles an hour, and it goes around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour, and then our solar system's flying through, I don't know, I can't remember if it was half a million miles an hour, but then our galaxy is supposedly also moving as well. You're going to see shifting. And you, and you don't do it. I think it's a limit of the system. I think that between our lifespan and uh, our being distracted by everything else that's down there, we just never noticed, like, like anybody that's noticed. Even the surveyor that I talked to, career surveyor, two different surveyors I talked to, uh, the one 32 years, he's been shooting long tracks of land, and he said the same thing. He's going, he goes, everybody missed it. Everybody missed it. He goes, there's two types of surveyors. There's geodetic surveyors and there's plane surveyors. Plane surveyors are told, and that's 90% of all the surveyors that are out there, are told that the world, he goes, treat every project like the world is perfectly flat, right? But but they think only that far. It's like, well, okay, the project is perfectly flat, but the world's not flat. Problem is, if all the projects are flat, then when does the curve come into play? And he's going, I never, he goes, it never came in, ever, ever. And we were talking big 10, 20 mile square tracks of land. Uh, the analogy I give is, look, if you cover a basketball, try to cover a basketball with some wheat thins, those little square crackers, eventually you're going to run into gaps. He goes, the gaps were never, ever there, ever, ever there. And uh, he goes, and, and he goes, but that's because it, it, everyone missed it because they weren't looking for it. Wow. Hmm. And then and you, like, you got the canal, like the, the Air, oh, is it the Arizona Canal? The oh, how, about, how about the Suez Canal? Yeah, I mean, Suez that's multiple, multiple miles. I think the longest one in the world, though, is actually uh, the one in Arizona, the, the Arizona Canal Path. But I would wonder if the people that there that were built would actually have had to plan for that. If if that was the case, you if it was a curve, would yeah, it, it would, right. look look at the look at the Roman look at something simple. Look at the Roman aqueducts. They, you know, they were piping in water from all over the place. They had what curvature formula were they using? They were, they weren't using any curvature formula, and yet because uh, right. eventually that project should have failed. They would have gotten to the point. It's like, hey, the water's not going anymore. Why not? 
they would have never figured that out, and uh, never never comes into play. Um, not even some of the people that I didn't even interview. Uh, Patricia Steer interviewed um, uh, Brian Mullen, who does balls out physics. He's a structural engineer, full blown structural engineer, and he's come right out and said no. He goes, he goes, he goes. The, the projects that we are building do not account for curvature. Doesn't happen. And you combine a structural engineer with a, uh, a plane surveyor and all the other guys, nobody's contradicting each other. That's the other thing. I Not only have I interviewed all these people, and they've come out not shy in any way, shape, or form, using their real name in most cases, nobody's come out against them. I've, I have yet to get a military guy. How hard is that to come online you know, and say, it's like, you know what, your Air Force guy is completely wrong, and here's why. Your Navy guy's completely off his rocker, here's why. You know, yeah, you'll get stuff in the comments. People will say stuff, but no one will actually come out officially and say it. And scientists are running away from us in droves. We can't, we, we've contacted at one point or another just about every major physicist in the United States. No one will talk about it. They, they can't because if they do, no one wants to be that guy. You, you're going to come on and lose. You know, there's questions they can't answer. They know. We send them the questions. Like, here's 20 questions. Answer all of them. If he can't answer even just five of them, he's, he's stuck. If somebody could come on and just make a simple debunk video like that, and, you know, like, okay, I saw a video, and I'm not sure exactly. I can't remember if it was Gons or somebody that did it, but they had a laser that went across a, a lake or a body of water, and there was no drop in after several miles. People could easily just go out and debunk that if it was if it was debunkable. I, yeah. And I'm, and I'm, I'm telling people because if, it, if you can do that, go do it because you'll get a viral video right off the bat if you just oh, try to start I, debunking some of this stuff. But nobody's I, done it yet, so it makes me wonder. It, no, and everybody, every time they try, it gets worse. Um, the uh, initially we had problems with the ship going over the horizon thing because there was this pirate ship that kept you know they it was it wasn't the the best quality in the world, but it showed the boat supposedly you know where it was going down hole first. But the problem was for every one of those, we've got another five or ten videos that with what's really amazing over the last five years is camera zoom technology, especially the uh, I think the Canon P900 or whatever it is, which just amazing zoom. And so you see a ship. In, with your eyes, go over the horizon. And then you put the zoom on your camera and you can bring it back. And then you don't even go full power. You let it go away again and you can bring it back. That's not possible if the curvature is there. Um, and I had a geodetic surveyor who said in a video uh, recently, and he was so frustrated because he knew he knew full well he was in prob he had problems. He's going, he's going uh, because it's 60 miles away, that should be several thousand feet below the curve, over, you know, over the hill. You should not be able to see the Sat Statue of Liberty from 60 miles away. He goes, fine. So you can see the Statue of Liberty from 60 miles away. So what? So what? Who cares? It's like, you talking about? Who cares? He shouldn't be able to see it. And he had yeah, no answer for shouldn't it. Shouldn't be able to see it at all. Um, and, you know, one thing that I'm going to try, I'm going to be in Florida the next month sometime, and I'm going to, my wife has a lens that's like, I know you can't see both my hands, but it's super long. It's a long yeah. lens because she's a photographer. Yeah. And um, I'm going to have them, I'm going to rent a boat and have them go out as far as they can go yeah. and, and clock on the GPS how far they're going and see how far I can zoom into it just to do a test of my own because it's interesting, man. I mean, yeah. like, you know, the, the thing in the Chicago the, uh, across that, across. Oh, yeah, lake. across Lake Michigan. Yeah. Yeah, that right there it blows my mind right there. It blows yeah. my mind. Yeah. Um, that shouldn't, that was one of our early ones. And initially it started out as a still shot because somebody had taken a picture from 52 miles and uh, from the other side of the lake and you shouldn't be able to see the entire Chicago skyline. There were people saying there was a mirage. Well, then. Uh, uh, I think it was the same guy actually shot, shot time lapse, and he didn't even—he's not a flat earther. He just shot time lapse of the Chicago skyline from the other ed edge of the lake. It was like 12, 15 hours. It covered multiple weather. Uh, it got—it was light, and then it turned dark, and you could see the lights. There was no wavering. There was no inversion. You were just seeing the entire skyline. You should not have been able to see it. And and people, it's like you want you want to call a picture a single picture a mirage. Fine, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Uh, uh, last time I checked, though, time lapses for mirages they don't last that long. Uh, not even not even close. And that I was felt intense. I felt bad for that weatherman trying to explain it away oh. as a mirage. It was the worst. <laughs> I mean, it went viral. It was the worst I've ever heard, yeah. and the best mirage I've ever seen on on yeah. film. But uh, yeah, it, that was that hurt watching. Yeah. Him. 
that. For me, you know, that was real a real treat was the uh, the Navy guy that came out. He the, the Sparrow missile instructor, a clever clever kid. He comes out because you know because if you try to throw him out, you know, for being crazy, it's even a better story than if you leave him in. But he was using two inch beam radar at sixty miles, painting ship to ship, and ships aren't that tall. Sixty miles, that's several thousand feet. He goes, we hit every time. He goes, we're not bouncing off the ionosphere. It is straight shot. And then some people say, well, you know, the ra- the, the the Earth's gonna grab, you know, the gravity is gonna bend the beam. I'm going really gonna grab it perfectly at sixty miles. What what about fifty or forty? It's always gonna grab it perfectly. Don't give me that. It's it's plus he was seeing thermal. He was using um, some advanced um, thermal infrared uh, binoculars, and he's going look. Infrared doesn't lie. He's going, I could see ships at thirty miles. Can I? It was show me a mirage where the thermal imaging is correct. It's it was amazing. He he started the wave of it, which was great. Sooner or later, scientists are going to have to come out and deal with the flat Earth subject. Yeah. Uh, it's just it's just blowing up. And like you said, you what, had over five million hits. Oh no no not just five million it's five million relevant uh, videos I and mean that's is... it's 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 blowing up on on just sheer number of people that are coming out because once you get it once you get that aha moment you get so pumped up it's amazing seeing people make their first videos people's never done videos before just create a YouTube channel it's like I want to talk about flat Earth I keep looking they have ten subscribers it's a, and it's it's just amazing yeah yeah it's blowing Generally, up later they're gonna have to come out and deal with this. Well, they tried with with Neil deGrasse Tyson. They tried a couple months ago, and it was so surreal watching it. But at the same time, uh, you know, doing it as long as I have, I still think there's an ulterior motive here. I think they want it to come out eventually. I think there's a secondary secondary play here. Well, I'm going to go on to the chat because there's questions just on there. I want to why why you you get that question together. Yeah, I think I think you're right about the idea behind them wanting to, to come out because I think that it plays into the whole alien deception that we've talked about on so many shows. It plays yes. right into that, and that's yeah. exactly why they want it to come out. And when they do, it's going to be a ground shaker because if you look at look at the way things are going, there's going to be um, – it's going to be crazy. It's going to be. It's not just like okay. It's the truth can come out. Everything's going to be okay. It's going to no. It's going to cause a lot of problems. A lot. I mean, major problems. Yep. You know. Yeah. You have to do it with something else. You can't just do it by. I've said this for months, which is you. It flat Earth is not a standalone situation. You have to combine it with something. It's it's the it's the left jab before the right hook. Uh, the question is, what's the right hook? Is it somebody going to land in the middle of somewhere and say, "Oh, we're here. We built it." Or you know, is it is it a false second coming? Oh, yeah, you could take your pick, but there's a right hook coming, that's, and that's, that's, that's well. Yeah. Yep. You go ahead, John. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just yeah, wanted I to. Know. I really think that that's well, that's what it's playing into because you've got um, you've got people like uh, you know popular rappers and and oh, people yeah. people coming out and saying stuff about it that you know and talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. So I mean, it's just it's um it's a matter of time, and I really do think that either if it is true. I think that they wanted to come out because they're they want it to come out in a way that they want um, to control it. Yeah, they want to control how it comes out. So anyway, yeah. go ahead, John. So no, no, that's a good point. Uh, I was just thinking about when you said that. Uh, who went to the Pope? When was it? I, I oh, saw you Leonardo, Leonardo, Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio, who just Talk, won his first Main, Oscar. Yeah. yeah, mainstream media is. I mean, you hear you hear little excerpts here and there. Yeah, uh, just yeah. Where where Rob Skiba was the first one to really latch onto that where. Leonardo DiCaprio, I showed him the video where he he goes to the Pope to talk about climate change and gives him a book with a painting where he said that, the, you know, there's a dome structure where the earth was flat and it used to be hung up above his crib. And then the Pope, he travels to Cuba to meet with the arch somebody down in Cuba, whoever the, the Catholic version of, of he is down in Cuba. That guy then goes to Antarctica for whatever reason we don't know to, to hang out at this little church down there, the only church in Antarctica. All these just weird, weird things. Yeah. Sorry. Uh-oh, can't hear you. Uh, no, I was just sorry about that. I, somebody was typing saying I look mad. I'm not mad. I promise. I had a. He doesn't uh, look mad. I, I don't. Hey. I'm, I'm not mad at all. I had a. I have my son. He's two years old. And I. I went to the zoo today and walking up these hills. So my back is absolutely killing me. So if I look, <laughs> if I, I'm, I'm not mad by any means. Just to let you guys know. So. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, talking about Antarctica. There's a question in the chat by Chad. He yeah. says, "What does Mark know about the UN treaty that all countries have signed saying they will not go to the Antarctica? That's off limits." Antarctica is you can okay. 
Let me clarify here because I, I tried to be as clear as I could in the clues, which was if you want to spend $15,000 and go down to Antarctica and take pictures of the penguins, you can go. However, if you have a company, and I don't care what company you own, uh, you cannot do business. You can Your corporation cannot go to Antarctica ever. And I mean that from, and which is weird because it is, it is universally signed. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are a small mineral company or the biggest oil production company in the world. Not only can you not go down there, I, oil companies from Russia can't go down there. China cannot go down. Nobody can go down there ever. Uh, not only they can't go down there, they can't even talk about going down there. So you'd think if I was, again, the, the head of Exxon Mobil and wanted to go down there, all I have to do is call up the New York Times, pay them a bunch of money and say, hey, I want to run a story every week saying how great it would be for my company to go down to Antarctica. It'd be great for America. You can't even do that. You can't lobby. You can't even go to, you, you, you know how the, the, it works, you know, money and power and greed. It's, it's everywhere. And you, you can lobby Congress. You can lobby the Senate. You can't even talk about it. It's crazy. Well, but yeah, saw, sorry, go ahead. Oh, your mic cut out. Your mic cut out, John. I think you might have muted it on accident. No. I was listening to you and Rob on one of your shows that you guys were talking about that uh, uh, the Pope and an Archbishop got together and then he went down to the Antarctica and he couldn't he couldn't vet that story that he yeah. went down there and did some ritual. Has has anything else come out of that? No, 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 no one's going to hear about that. We the they took the pictures of him standing next to the penguins and going into that tiny church. I have no idea why that thing was there. Um, but the the other the other half of that story that he you know that a big sh Soviet crew or you know a Soviet blockade of ships supposedly carrying an ark. Now I'm not saying it was the Ark of the Covenant. It could have been a different ark. But yeah, there was all sorts of weird stuff tied to it. I believe some of it. You know, there's some stories that just you know they're not they're not going to tell us. It's not they're not going to get leaked out uh, for whatever reason. But we do know he did, he went down there after the Pope had talked to him, after Leonardo DiCaprio had talked to the Pope. I mean, yeah, you could say, oh, you're just connecting the dots. I'm going, there's some pretty weird dots to connect, but they all happened. Well, Chad, come up with another question. I'm just going to start throwing them at you real quick. Sure. Uh, what do you know about Operation Fishbowl and Operation High Jump? All math would collapse as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, okay, Operation High Jump was first. That was in 1946. That was Admiral Byrd's biggest military mission where he goes down to Antarctica with a full carrier fleet looking for something. Now, what people say, well, was he fighting the Nazis? Did they run into UFOs? It's like, yeah, maybe. But he did take a full-blown carrier group. What exactly happened is still shrouded in mystery. But um, hang on, I have to close. You probably hear some noise in the background. Give me, give me one second. Right back. Yeah, no, no problem, man. I, this is interesting, man. I, I just stay Sorry about that, guys. No problem. Sorry. The, um, okay, so he goes down there in 1946. It was a leaf blower. <laughs> it was outside. So it was, gonna get, it was just going to get worse before it got better. So <laughs> the, uh, he goes down there, and whatever happened down there in 1946, I don't think was that big a deal because by 1954, when he goes on the Long Jeans Chronoscope show, that CBS show, it didn't seem to be a factor. So whatever happened in 1946, they took care of it. Now, did they did they rout the Nazis and and whatever happened, or did they scare the Nazis into it? You know, into into asking for asylum with wh whoever's running the place. Uh, then uh, uh, you know it's it's possible. Whatever happened, it didn't make any difference in the long run because by 1954, when he went on television, he didn't seem to really care. He was like, oh, no, we're just going to go down there and make money. Operation Fishbowl, completely different thing. That was part of the atomic weapons program testing high altitude uh, nuclear. I got remember I don't say nuclear, nuclear testing, uh, which started in 1958. And then in 1962, between um, the United States and the Soviet Union, where they were basically taking atomic weapons and just firing them straight up for four years, just pounding. I mean, and those first shots were not small. Three megatons was a was a considered a very big shot in the 1950s. And part of the packages, part of one of the packages on the United States side, the Russians don't have clever names like we do. Um, part of the, one of the packages on the United States side was called Operation Fishbowl weird name to put on a, a rocket testing program that's going test, you know, going straight up and blowing up atomic weapons. It was really, really strange. Um, the one I don't think was a, was necessarily a big deal. Uh, if, if the Germans did go down there, they never resurfaced. Uh, the only time they resurfaced was in the movie Iron Sky, which was a few years ago. Uh, as far as the atomic weapons program testing, 
that was that was going straight up for four years. That went four years, and then the Soviet Union and the United States stopped on exactly the same day. Uh, they had several other packages while they were doing it as well. Fishbowl was probably the most interesting, and they, um, in my opinion, they had done they had taken it to the limit. They had hit they had hit that sucker, and that's typical of what we would do, right? You know, you find a dome, it's like let's punch through it. What do I got? Wham! And and atomic weapons weren't going to help. So then I think they they were trying over the last well five decades trying different things. I thought I think Harp initially was was designed to be a frequency issue where maybe they could kind of phase shift it maybe, and then now now we have CERN, and CERN I think is the biggest boldest which is okay. Maybe we can't do it with with brute force. Maybe we can just open a door, you know, sci-fi style, and you know just get out without actually having to to deal with the dome itself. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be interviewing a guy named uh, help me out here. He, wrote, he did the uh, the book um, Shinar Directive. Uh, uh, Dr. Michael Lake. Michael Lake, and he yeah. talks about uh, one of the spots that they built Babylon. He believes that there is there was like a loose point or a, a weak point, and not he doesn't talk about the ferment because I'm pretty sure he doesn't believe in flat Earth. But he's talking about the uh, about the to into another realm, and, and yeah. maybe maybe that could have something to do with it there. That's pretty interesting. To yeah. think about, and and that's not something I'll probably bring up to him because I'm pretty sure he doesn't believe in flat Earth. But when when he started talking, <laughs> when he, when he started talking about that, when you guys started talking about Operation Fishbowl trying to bust out, that's one of the first things. If I had the money, I would test. I would go straight up as hard, hard and fast. Get that thing go. with everything you got. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a guy we follow, uh, Anthony Patch, on, and we we watch his stuff on CERN, and we've noticed we we downloaded uh, the uh, earthquake. App and you just get all the earthquakes that's hit that they that they report and yeah. over the last I'd say six weeks just yesterday I counted from midnight all the way up until about nine last night was like 58 earthquakes with maybe six or seven of them being over five five point oh and more. Yeah. Does that play out in flat Earth as far um, as everything everything that's all right, let me let's see if I can put this in a certain way. Because I, I have caught caught some flack because I've said, look, if if we are in a giant terrarium slash planetarium, whatever, everything is artificial. And I know it's tough for people to let go of all the other things. And I said, look, if you're gonna have a little terrarium with a spider in it, a tarantula, is anything that you do in that terrarium, is anything you do going you're gonna leave it to chance? You know, so yeah, you're gonna have a light bulb for them and maybe a night light at night, and you're gonna have a nice glass cage and some stuff on the bottom. Are you really going to put anything, you're going to leave anything in there that could be random? And so when people will talk about tectonics or they'll talk about um, uh, volcanoes, and they'll say, well, why wouldn't the magma system be be natural? I'm going, why in the world would you leave a volcanic system on that, you know, to be natural? I go, you, you, one super volcano and this whole thing is done. It is, it is cooked. So... Everything would be part of it. Everything from uh, the underwater conveyor system that controls the uh, the ocean currents, uh, uh, the jet stream which controls the atmospheric stuff, uh, and everything else in between the the magma system, the tectonic system, all in my opinion, not only is it all necessary, but it all works better in an enclosed system. It's way easier. Rob Skiba was the first one to to show what what like the weather systems. If you put it onto a as a muffle map, you change it into a flat map. It's just this beautiful circle with with a few little swirls every once in a while, and it's just so much easier than that, all that crap that's supposedly going around the globe. It's a much more efficient system, and I'm not saying I, I never ever would say that that God was lazy in any way, shape, or form. What I'm saying is God is very, very efficient. I think Carl Sagan knew, and he kind of hinted at it. He's going, look, he's going. There's an awful waste of space that's out there. There's these huge tracts of space out in their solar system. There's nothing there. You know, and galaxies. There's these massive. He goes, it's just, it just, it just seems like there should be more there. Well, what if it's the complete opposite? What if it's all right here? And uh, you know, as long as, because again, as long as the population believes the illusion, why would you, why would you make a big solar system? He's like, well, God is infinite. God can make the solar system. Yeah, but he doesn't have to. Not if everyone buys it. If everyone buys it, then it becomes a much more interesting story. Uh, you know, they can you you can make it up now. I do think at one point, 500 years ago, that uh, whoever created this place helped the story along because it buys you time. Because eventually, 
uh, people, I, and I did a clue on this, if people, if people find the edge, that's all, again, it's, it's what's going to happen. If people find the edge, all anyone's going to care about is the edge. They will not care about anything else that's going on in the world. They're only going to care about the edge. The human beings do not like being confined. So what you do is you make it seem like there is no edge. How do you do that? You create a ball that you can circle all day long and there's no fence. And that worked. It worked brilliantly. Not only that, when you get to somewhere that seems like the edge will be, it's so cold and bitter. Yeah. Who wants to go over there, you know? <laughs> so. the, the, natu the natural reinforcements, the, the natural negative reinforcements are brilliant. Oh, it is so brilliant. Uh, you know, little things like a 3% salt solution in the ocean. Just enough to where human beings can't drink it, but but life forms, other life forms can, can live in it. You get out to the outer edge, and icebergs start showing up. If you actually make it to the Antarctic coastline, it's 200 feet straight up of ice. You get if you can get on top of that thing, then you've got no plant life, no no animal life. There's no supplies, and then it just starts going up and up and up and up, and it goes up to two miles, and it stays at two miles until you get to the higher mountains. You couldn't ask for a more inhospitable place, so that. Every time you think, so it's the most negative reinforcement. So what it does is it, it makes you, kind of like the Truman Show, it makes you change your mind. But you think it's your change. It's like, oh, it's too cold, I'm turning around. Oh, there's ice, I'm turning around. There's nothing to eat, I'm turning around. It's all your decision. You don't think that somebody's forcing you. Now, if there was a big, giant, golden stop sign there that says, do not go any further, what do you think people would do? They would go, you know, there'd be a whole church, worship the golden stop sign. So. Anytime you see deception in anything, it's a, it's a form of control, uh, yeah. controlling people. And that's basically what that is. It's just controlling people. And yeah. uh, it's interesting the lengths that uh, powers that be will go to keep the people controlled. Yeah. And you're right. If somebody figured out, hey, there's an edge, it would be all about the edge. Yeah. Because I'd want yeah. to and, and people will say, well, didn't ancient societies know? Didn't people know? And I said, yeah, yeah, you bet they knew. But until you have technology to exploit it, what are you going to do? You, you can't do anything. I, I joked that uh, the king of France, let's say the king of France knew in 1400, right? He has a map and shows him the whole flat world. What's he going to do about it? Until the internal combustion engine gets invented, you don't even have planes. You just have wooden ships. You're not going anywhere. And that's that's what happened. I mean, literally, as soon as planes were invented, Bird goes to the North Pole. Then he turns around and he goes to the South Pole. And then he spends 30 years in Antarctica looking for something. And, and looked like after 25 of those years, they just gave up. They said, well, apparently our maps, we couldn't find it. And then Murphy's Law, you know, the second they do that, the very next mission, Operation Deep Freeze in 1955, the whole thing changes. And uh, that was brilliant because, again, they gave it away because he's on television saying, this place is made out of money. And there's going to be people, we're going to be, everyone's going to be down there forever, for the next century. And then two years later, no one ever gets to go down there ever again. No country, they, All the countries leave at the same time. All of them. Russia, they're rebuilding from the war. Britain, they're rebuilding from war. You know, Argentina, Chile, Australia, uh, New Zealand. All of them leave, sign a piece of paper. Yeah, we're never going back there. Nope. Never. What is that? And nobody catches it. It's it's great. I love it. That was, in fact, that worked for more than anything The as far as how the clues went because you had the Admiral Byrd footage. You know the the him on the television show. It's talking about it. Almost probably the United States' most respected uh, explorer saying the the you know turning to complete 180. Yeah. So. No, there's no doubt about it. And what you know, I, I keep asking myself, what would it take? What kind of evidence would it take for me for me to say, you know, what uh, the Earth is flat or the Earth is a globe? Because I mean, to me, either one is hard to fathom. I mean, obviously, it, it has to be probably one or the other. But when I look at it, when I look at the evidence for the globular side, all I can really have is the idea that I've, I've always been taught this. And then I can also, you know, math, certain kinds of mathematics, astronomy, and stuff like that. But then I look at the flatter side, the parts that we as normal humans can actually uh, test, and it seems to be pointing to the flat Earth side of, of things. But, like, I'm, I keep asking myself, what am I going to have to see to for me to believe that the Earth is flat because I'm I'm listening to all this and this is like really it's really interesting to me and I have this I have this thought that it's like I really want to go check it out now myself do whatever I can do but like what would I have to see to be like this is on the ground you would it would it's it, that is a tall order um I had a debate with a scientist uh, a couple months ago now uh, Brian Dunning I believe man he he surprised me because I came at him and I said look. If you had to take the average man on the street from a scientist's point of view and you had to prove the curve, how would you do it? 
And he and he and he, and he, and he paused. And I thought he would need jerk reaction to that thing, and he didn't. And he goes, you know what? He goes, I couldn't do it. He goes, you can't prove it on the ground. From a scientific standpoint, you cannot prove the curve on the ground. He goes, I'd have to give you twenty million dollars, and you'd have to go up uh, up to space. And then I realized, and that's it kept circling back to the same thing. The gatekeepers are already up there, and the gatekeepers are the United States military. Now, yes, you can say there's other space agencies, but the United States military was the one that started this thing. Well, I mean, there's, so, private, there's private organizations that have had it, but they keep getting bought out by yeah. the government organizations. I know there was one recently where Obama decided he wasn't going to fund NASA. A private organization stepped up, and then they ended up getting bought by NASA somehow. So Yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah, they don't. They don't want private corp. Private corporations could have been involved since day one because they were supplying the parts. Um, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, those guys. Those are big players, big, big military contracts. But to your question, if the, how is at least I can only speak from my standpoint because I've been talking to all these guys. The for me the the brass ring is someone from the space program, whistleblowing. That's really. That's really the big one because you can't – yeah, you can – on the ground, it shouldn't be – and there's no play on words here – both sides shouldn't be level. It should be a slam dunk for the globe side, which is why the globe is having such a hard time because it's like, look, the mountain of evidence should be here against a flat earth, but it's not. They're both going head-to-head, -head and that should not be possible. Um up until you know, up, but until somebody from the space program, either retired or current, you know, someone comes in and says, you know, there's a lie, or you know, they make some public announcement. I'm not necessarily expecting Neil deGrasse Tyson to come out and say that. Although he did surprise us just last week when he said that, uh, oh yeah, when he was arguing with a physicist during a conference, saying that not only is a virtual reality possible, it's probable. And everybody, he was like the only guy on the panel to say this. I was going, wait, you were the same guy that dropped the mic on national television and said the Earth isn't effing flat, but it's virtual. How, how do you how do you how do you do both of those things? I, that really really bothered me. So it makes me think that you know there's they're still waiting for disclosure and they're going to try to control it at some point. I look at I look at I want to tell people real quick. There's a lot of people in here that may want to ask questions. Go to sure. the link in the bottom of the description. Go there to the chat room, um, ask some questions to people, uh, or ask some questions to us where we'll lay them. And there might actually be some questions in the chat room right now. John, do you notice any? Or I haven't, I haven't been looked at it in a while. Throw them at me. Uh, right. Your mic's off. Mic's off, John. Mic's muted, brother. Let's see who's trying. There we go. Oh, it's a rookie mistake. You hate to see it. Hey, he's. I'm a guy in training. He's brought me on board. And he's me up, so. No, I, ha I have to say that because I actually talked, because I do my own show on, on Tuesdays, and I actually talked for 11 minutes, and no one, I, I didn't read my emails, and so I, I realized that my I was muted the entire time. I was like, oh, really? That's so. hilarious. I'm looking at this video here in the chat room right now somebody sent. This. Is that yeah, one? There's, a, there's, there's a tough question in there for you, there Mark. Are. Uh, how does how do you what's your view on Jesus Christ doing flat Earth? I don't know where that came from, but that's that seems like a tough question. It seems like Rob Skiba, one of your, uh, your you know peer, he has a tough time with that issue with people saying, well, how's this you know how's this going oh, to be like like, like, if, like if I had a flat Earth T-shirt with a flat Earth on one side and the back it said, what would Jesus think? Exactly. One of those, one of those yeah. deals. Um, exactly. I think that. He it, his role really doesn't change much in this, with the exception of you know what you know what I I, I will go back because actually I'm surprised that that Rob didn't say this. There was a I don't remember the chapter and verse. Someone will have to look it up for me. Where during the second coming, the whole and I was bothered by this in Sunday school when I was a kid, which was when when during the second coming. Oh, that's Brian Mullen, Balls Out Physics, great guy. Um, uh, during the second coming, every one will be able to see the second coming at the same time. And on a circular, on a ball, on a spherical object, that is really, really tough. So how do you pull that off? Well, if it's a, if it's a flat surface, then yeah, yeah, it's very easy to do. It's extremely easy. It's, you just show up and everyone can see you. And there was, there's been stories in other um, mythologies for years. Um, in fact, I think there's one. I don't know if it's Old Testament or if it's another religion where there was a tree in the center of the earth and it grew so high it could be seen from all corners of the earth. Uh, but anyway, if you're talking specifically Jesus, that's the only reference I really have. Well, except for the time that well, I know more about the Bible than I thought. 
where um, where Jesus was taken up onto the highest of all mountains with Satan, and Satan showed him the breadth of the world mm. from a single peak. Exactly. And uh, so, I do I think Jesus knows it's a flat earth? Yes, I do. And I think he'd wear the t-shirt. <laughs> I think it's interesting when people are like, what does flat earth have to do with winning people to Christ? It's like, yeah. well, what, is, what does football have to do with winning people to Christ? What does taking your kid to the zoo or what is well, taking it's, to playing basketball it's, have to do with Well, it, I think it's direct, though. I, and I know there's there are pastors that have, have gave, actually given me grief and said, look, we don't want this to distract from, from the message, which is God. And I was going, this is bringing people to God. Mm -hmm. Because oh, yeah. if you're giving them a hint, it's like, look, if there's proof, which is why I, I delayed it as long as I could, but when I made a clue that was called Hiding God and somebody actually turned it into a full-blown documentary, it's out there on YouTube, called Hi They're Hiding God with the Greatest Lie Ever. That's my stuff. But it's not even my channel. The um, but I said, look, if there is proof of intelligent design, if there is proof of God, it's it's that's that's what you want. It's what everyone's been wanting for the longest time. You know, what, what do you think? You know, everybody, whether you're a devout uh, a religious person or not, everybody at some point gets in their hands and knees. I mean, maybe not at their own bed, but they they say, look, give me a sign, show me you're out there, show me proof. If this is it. It's the greatest thing ever. It changes it changes if civilization we're really, overnight. We're really living in an enclosed system. There's no way to doubt the existence of intelligent design, right. whether or not no. they want to believe it's, you know, Yahweh of the Bible or whatever. It doesn't, you know, either way. There's no way to to deny the existence of an intelligent design there. I mean, because I, it, you know, it's one thing to think that our planet's spinning hundreds of miles and thousands of miles an hour. <laughs> Galaxies. Yeah. I mean, then it's easy to almost think, you know, yeah, sure, it could be, it could be chance, I guess, of billion, given billions of years or whatever. But if we're living yeah. in an enclosed terrarium, you can't think that way. I mean, it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and There's no way. Yeah, to you can't. You can't. Yeah, it is. I, I, I've said that it is really tough to be an atheist if this thing come actually happens because you're, you're going to be really, really stuck. But I also want to throw in the, um, the whole line again. Not going to get chapter and verse which is uh, the great deception, the one that fools even the elect. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if this isn't a likely candidate for that, I don't know what is. A, a trick so good that everybody falls for it. Uh, it, it to me, this is, it, it's got, it is either that or, of course, you, know, you combine this with you know, the, what we all know, the, the false second coming. That, which it's it's funny because I used to think well if if somebody actually showed up and said they were Christ who's going to believe them right well if a spaceship lands right now and someone came out and said I built this and you know we're they could say just about anything they wanted and people would buy it and because because the media is going to cover it anyway sorry go on no I see uh, Rob hassle with a lot of people on his Facebook page when he put something out and he had mentioned something about Yeshua landing on the Mount of Olives and everything splitting but everybody seeing him land on the Mount of Olives and people were throwing out chapters and verses at him and he says look there's going to be so much mayhem and destruction before that happens that nobody could use their cell phone nobody can use their cameras I mean it's just going to be all everything's going to be knocked out so it's got to be well he said it has to be on a flat earth for everybody to see him come see, down yeah. Yeah. So I did. I didn't cover that in the clues, but the two that really stuck out at me, uh, both were from Sunday school days. One was the whole Joshua story. Hopefully, I got the name right. Uh, where Joshua asked God to hold the sun in the sky for an extra day so he could slay more enemies. That was and, and I thought, I thought, you know, when you're younger, it's like, how? Oh, wow, that's how do you pull that off? You got to stop the whole solar system, and you got to stop the Earth rotating, and everything. You got to stop everything. You don't stop just the Earth. You stop everything. But then in an enclosed system, it's like. Oh, that isn't hard at all. He's, well, think about it. He's, the sun stopped. It was the sun that stopped, not yeah. the earth, but it was yeah. just the sun. Just the sun. And when I first heard that from you guys, it was coming out, and I was like, I've never read it that way. Yeah. It was the sun. He stopped the sun, not the earth, from spinning. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't read that way either. Um, and then the more the one that was more prominent to me, which I had fun with, even though I never said it by name, I just wanted people to guess, was the Tower of Babel, which was you know the Tower of Babel that's going to reach you know reach heaven. And I'm going. Wait, where's that tower going exactly? If the Earth is spinning on its axis and it's also moving through space, you're not going anywhere. I, you know, you think you finally get to a certain point, you know, and then it's going to line up. But if it's an enclosed system, you know exactly where you're going. You have a goal in mind. John, Andrew, you mentioned. And, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. John, you mentioned something about Dr. Michael Lake and the Tower of Babel since he brought it up. What was what was is it the area that he was talking about? Yeah, he, they, he believes that there's certain areas like the land of Shinar 
where they're uh, where they believed the people that built these towers and these places and even the pyramid areas they believed that there was weak spots in what they would what, what he called the um, I guess the interdimensional portals or whatever and well, I guess if you believe flat earth you could think of it as a, a weak spot in the actual firmament itself and possibly depending on the interdimensional side of this you know of of what's going on, I don't, you know, it's hard for me to say, but I just, I thought that was pretty interesting to think about it that way, because if that, if they were actually trying to build something to a spot where they thought was a weak spot in the firmament, and because yeah. the whole goal, if you read the book of Jasher and, and other extra biblical books, was for them to uh, storm the throne room of God, get into yeah. that certain part of heaven to storm the, his throne room. And, they would have and, to get past that dome. And, and by the way, why also was interesting was you know in the whole Babel thing. I, I want to bring up a Jasher thing real quick too. But in the in when you're building the tower, you 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 read in the thing where God says they're gonna make it. You know that was the summary. It's like they're gonna make it, and I'm gonna put a stop to this like right now. It wasn't like they were just building a tower just going nowhere. He's going. Oh yeah, these guys are totally gonna get this thing done, and we just cannot have that. Let's do the whole language thing. You know, crumble, crumble, and and do that. Um, the other thing was an interesting uh, at the end of Jasher. And I didn't know much about Jasher. And I still don't really know that about Jasher. When chapter three, when Enoch is leaving, right at the very last part of of chapter three in Jasher, he said, "You know, he is, of course, no one wants Enoch to leave. So there's all these people following him, but they couldn't follow him because he walked." off the edge of the earth and we got to that edge they were really good about saying that he got to this point where there was ice and snow and more ice and more snow and they couldn't pass he kept going and they had to stop because it was too bad I was going you know in most biblical stuff you don't hear about a lot of snowy places it's always desert and palm trees and dates and stuff like that you don't get a lot of snow references well uh, they they date the book of Enoch 400 years before Yeshua walked the earth, or whoever wrote it, you know, during that time. But it's at yeah. the same time, how did they know about the cold, the ice in the north, the cold, the ice in the south? I mean, this mm. person was writing this, you know, in a very hot place. So yeah. how did he know about this? Yeah. So I mean, it's it's just the knowledge. You were talking about the Tower of Babel, and, but you had mentioned CERN earlier. Yeah. So what's the connection between CERN and the flat Earth? CERN, I think. Well, I don't know if I want to get too much into it, but I, if this is a jailbreak scenario, if this place is not just enclosed, but it was also enclosed to hold something in or some beings in, because people have said, well, if we're not the first people, it's obvious we are not the first civilization to be here by any question, because there have been disasters that have wiped out other civilizations, not just the Great Flood, but look at the, the sunken cities off of Japan and off of, of India. Uh, not to mention, I, you know, I've been to the pyramids. I have no idea how old they are, but they're, weren't not, they were not built by us. Uh, or anyone even close to us. Um, but if it's a jailbreak scenario, that means that people said, well, who was the first people to be here? You know, who were the first who were the first residents? And was going, it might be a little creepy to say, but, you know, could the first residents have been the fallen? In which case, then it gets kind of interesting because it turned this place could turn into sort of a, uh, um, a novelty scenario where, the, because it's obvious the fallen aren't walking amongst us necessarily, so maybe you could use every civilization and see if they could look at a problem with a new set of eyes. Maybe the fallen couldn't get out, but maybe every civilization has their own problem-solving abilities. It's like, oh, what you got? Oh, we got atomic weapons. Uh, it's okay. It's not doing anything. What else you got? A harp. That's not bad. What else you? What else you working on? Ooh, that CERN thing. That looks pretty interesting. You know, as our civilization, but there's a time limit. I think. I think you can only allow a civilization to get so far, and then, well, then Act Three happens, and then the whole thing starts. You know, we we get back to whatever whatever happens when the transition happens. Well, there's a lot of connection between the esoteric CERN and and the story of Tower of Babel, yeah. and we we talk about the different levels of heaven within the scripture mm -hmm. and my son asked me today because he he lives on uh, he lives on Rob's page on the flat earth I mean he's he's digging everything that he's doing he watches your videos and I watch them with you cool his question today was he's 16 he wanted to know what do you think is above the dome I believe uh, it's not the first time I've been asked this but I and I've been thinking about this for a number of years way before flat earth which is uh, I believe it's an unlimited universe. If you want to know kind of a, a graphical description, take a look at the, uh, everyone's seen it, the Flammarion, F-L-A-M-M-I-R-I-O-N, 
It's, it was designed in 1888. It's a woodcut where the story goes that the, the Catholic Church had sent out monks. They had heard the story that there were the corners of the earth, and they said, find the edge and see what's beyond it. And there's this little scene where a monk is looking underneath from our world, which is this planetarium, into this dimension. And if you can, in fact, you can see Ezekiel's wheel outside, and, and it's all these... It's, it's, it's it's wonderful cascading layers of, of different universes. I think it's an unlimited universe outside of this, meaning we are because everything in here is built on so many layers of conflict. Uh, it's 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 almost inescapable conflict. No matter how rich you are, how powerful, how beautiful, you run into layers of, of, of misery and suffering to a certain degree. There's always something going on. And even if you had it all perfect, let's say you're the most wonderful athlete, model, rock star politician and and you were a saint on top of it you know all these things you're still going to have to deal with mortality and your own health so what's outside of here there's different you know of course every religion's got their different names for heaven shambhala nirvana take your pick but i think it is the opposite of here uh, i think it is an unlimited universe where we and part of the reason we're here is because you can't I don't want to dig into it too much because then I'm talking, you know, playing with the whole idea of what God's doing. But I don't think you can appreciate what that is until you come here, because. But, it, uh, sorry. Well, it well, sounds got, like it's it's uh, deepening your faith, your yes. personal faith. Oh yeah, absolutely, it, it has. I was I was my spirituality was waning to say the least, and when I got into this thing, it was an immediate snap because it was like okay. There's a creator. Now, I had, I, I had kind of thought that anyway a while back when I was kind of deal, deal, delving into static world theory about wh why this world was built. But I will never do, and I wasn't kidding when I, because I'm trying to be an optimist about this. If people find out they're gonna do, they're gonna do the right thing because the astronauts like they wouldn't lie on 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 camera or you know they wouldn't lie under oath uh, because I think they were afraid. Uh, I won't do anything malicious to anyone ever again, ever. Because I believe there's a scorecard on our lives, and we have been watched since day one. And I think the rules also change. Once you, once you, once you know, then you have no excuse. It's like, well, you knew, but you robbed the bank anyway. It's like, um, I didn't really know you knew. But up until that, I think they give you some, they give you some leeway. Up and you know, if you're you're if you don't know much about spirituality and right and wrong and good and bad, and uh, you you get a pass. Kind of, but once you know, oh yeah, I there's nothing you couldn't make me do it now uh, because it the the argument I give to people is, uh, and you can watch the clue to watch the astronauts who don't lie under oath. But the argument is, okay, so everyone's run a stop sign in their life, everyone's done that, right? But as soon as they put a camera on that stop that intersection, you don't run it anymore. Why not? Well, I'll get caught because they're going to take my picture. I go, then why were you thinking about doing it in the first place? You're, you're only you're only doing the right thing because you had to. There's no doubt about that. When if you if you can think you're being watched, which I you know I tend to think that anyway, of being a believer. But as a flat earth, there's no doubt. I went one thing that, about CERN. We we're talking about CERN that is interesting to me. I was, you know, going off this whole idea of the uh, of the uh, weak spots or whatever. At, you know, where CERN is built, you know, lo location is where they believe the the uh, temple to Apollo w was built. And you know, if it obviously in Revelation. Chapter nine, it talks about the he gave the angel the key to the bottomless pit, mm -hmm. and um, and whose name is Abaddon, with the Greek tongue that's Apollyon, which yep. that's that's where that. It's really interesting, man. I wonder if this geographical location. I was looking it up on maps just a second ago, just to kind of see where it was at, and um, I, I would like to see what the parallel it is on. But that is that's is an interesting thought to think about. Something to research anyway. Yeah, agreed. So. That wasn't really a question, I guess. It was more of a... But <laughs> That's I, okay. That's all right. <laughs> but I think we do have some more more questions on here. I'm not sure. There was what one you, um, about... Yeah, there's there's a few. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead, man. I haven't been keeping up with it. This, right one's from, this one's from Justin. He says, best new flat earth idea, in my opinion, is digging into China. Ask Mark if he has <laughs> ever thought about that. If you think about at the very center of the earth... Uh, earth up and down would flip. So I don't, I, I'm not familiar with the, the, the question. He says, best new flat yeah, earth idea. I, I, know, I know what he's saying. The, the, the old theory which kids used to think about is if there was a hole that went through, and actually they, they, they did this in a movie, and I can't remember what movie it was where they had a tram that went from one end of the, end of the planet to the other, and 
it, theoretically speaking, if the world was a sphere and if you believed in modern astrophysics, your your gravity would get less and less and less. You would weigh less and less until you got to the core of the Earth, which would weigh nothing. And then you would, you know, as you went through, you would gain more and more weight as, as you came out the other side. But for me, it's all a moot point, which is actually good that you brought this up because I actually did a, a part of a clue on it, which was something that always bothered me. In mainstream science, they'll say that the Earth is 8,000 miles wide, roughly, right? We'll just route it up a little bit to 8,000 miles wide, which means it's 4,000 miles to the center. And you see these cross sections. You see the, the, you know, you see it goes from red to orange to yellow to white, you know, this blinding white milky center. And I'm going, oh, wow, that's really great. So you got a probe down that far. You got a probe down for 4,000 miles. No, 2,000? 1,000, 100, 10, you, got, you even do 10 miles? No, the deepest hole ever drilled by any corporation uh, has been 8 miles. So if you've only drilled down 8 miles, which is uh, just a fraction of 1% of, of the distance just to get to, half, you know, to the center, forget about going all the way, what exactly is that cross-section you're showing us? You know, and and they they'll now science will back up a little bit and they'll say, well, we're extrapolating from volcanic things we see here and there, rock formations and seismic radar that we're bouncing in. We're we're knocking on it. We're pretty sure we know it's down there. I go, yeah, but you don't know. So why? And and here's where science runs into the same thing. You know, they 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 run it fall in the same traps as religion does sometimes, which is. Why don't you just, instead of showing to show us a cross-section, why don't you show us a globe with a big question mark on the inside of it? Because you don't know. Because science doesn't like doing that, because people hate question marks. And so science just takes a liberty, and they say, well, that's pretty much what we're, we're sure. And But then they then they go off the reservation, they go even further as well, and then they'll give us cross-sections of Venus and Mars and Neptune and Jupiter. And how, how in the world did you pull that off? So anyway, the answer to his question is it's a moot point. Um, digging to China... You can't even start to dig it. That, the irony is you can't even start to dig it to China. Once you get eight miles down, the drill bits stop. Uh, the Russians tried it. The Germans tried it. Years. We're not talking short operations. We're talking they got down to eight miles, and they were stuck at eight miles, and they just couldn't do it. You know, five, ten years. Could not get it going. Uh, so it's just one of those... Sorry, it's one of those things I rant. I'm not saying that all science is bad by any stretch. I'm not saying this sh should turn into a war between religion and science. Science has given us things like light bulbs and air conditioning and smartphones, for better or for worse with the smartphones. But they've given us so many things that have not helped us. Uh, you know, everything from lead paint to DDT to asbestos to, you know, not to mention all the military pro projects that have been going on for all these times. I mean, I could go on and on. So... Science has taken. Science took over 500 years ago and just been gaining steam and gaining steam. And now they appear at one point, you know, not that long ago, had a stranglehold. But that stranglehold seems to be dissolving very, very quickly. And which is also why they're they're not going. They're going to fight this tooth and nail because scientists all over the world are going to be in real, real trouble because all, people are going to say, okay, you were wrong about this. What else are you wrong about? And then they'll turn to uh, the scriptures and they'll say, huh. That actually was right. What else is that right about? And then the whole paradigm changes. Sorry, that was my rant. No, sorry, man. I was looking at this video. Somebody, this guy, this guy had made, um, I guess he said he made it. I don't know. But anyway, yeah, I, that's, it's interesting, man, to say the least. Now, I want to I want to wrap this show up. Here sure. uh, we were you know, an hour and a half in. We wanted to go an hour, but this is a subject. Oh, that's cool. No, I knew you couldn't do it. <laughs> we, yeah, we could probably go for uh, you know a lot longer. We go a long time on this. We sure can. I'd love to have you back to discuss a little bit more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, if your viewers will allow it, I know people. You get to remember, there's a backlash, and I know people because this is well, this isn't your first show on this, right? No, this is, we had Rob one before, and I don't care, man, because uh, to right. be to be perfectly. Um, you know, I like I, I I gave that disclaimer at the beginning. We have people on to give their insight on things. We are questioners of, of everything, and that's what we pride ourselves on on being people that are actually question things. And people that don't want to question the subject, whatever, don't question let, it. We let, do. let, me, let me throw this out really real quick for for the listeners out there because you were saying, you know, how would I how would you prove something? Let me throw it right back at them, and and because this is something that we've been doing now for months, which is. Anyone that can show me where the curve is, show it to me. I mean, you, you think people say, oh, no, I've seen an airplane. And I put this out 15 months ago. I said, you see an airplane? Fine. Take a picture of it. Put it on your laptop. Hold a straight edge up to it. If the curve's still there, you send me a picture of it. I will put it on air. I will put it on my show. No one's ever done it. 
show me the curve somewhere. That's the that's the easiest one to go after. It should be eight inches per mile squared. Yeah. It's not there. So I, you know, again, prove me wrong. Anyone that's out there, I know there's people saying flat Earth is dumb. It's stupid. I'm going fine. Prove me wrong. If there, yeah, and if there's somebody out there that thinks that they know all the answers to these questions, I'll be happy to host a debate if somebody out there knows what they're talking about and wants to actually do it. But I, you know, the problem is I'm not hearing from the other side very much. So I'm hearing no. from the flat Earth side, and I'm hearing a lot of things that are super interesting. So we decide we're going to do it. If and I, you know, I know a lot of my viewers are, you know, like, why are you guys getting on this stuff? But you know, honestly. We're here to question things. We're here to learn. And in, yeah. unless you can hear a side, this side and that side, unless you can hear multiple, because anybody, I, I talked about this before, anybody can make something sound legitimate if they want to. All they have to yeah. do is put together a well-formed thesis, put together the facts that they want, and leave out all the uh, facts opposing it. But in order to really prove your point or test your point, there has to be an antithesis. There has to be, there has to be somebody that can test what you're saying. Yeah. And, um, how do you do that? You have shows that are different about different things. You talk about these things, and that's the way, you know, and they're like, oh, debates. Like, I like debates personally because they help me learn. Uh, the Bible, in, in Acts, they had a debate. They had you know, There was a debate with Peter, Paul, and all those, and uh, Barnabas. They debated certain things, and they came to a conclusion on it. The problem is people won't ever, like most people that debate or argue, they do not care what the other person has to say they're waiting for their turn to talk and yep. here that's that's not what we're here for we're here to learn because I want to know I want to know about these things I'm not gonna I like I've said so many times I'm right about this I'm right about this four years later I was wrong you know how many times am I gonna have to say that before I start learning that you know what I'm gonna research and I'm gonna keep researching until I figure out the truth I'm not just gonna go ahead and say somebody's wrong right off the bat without ever testing it that's foolish you know the Bible talks about that you know hearing only one side and then not hearing the other and making up your mind makes a fool out of you and so I'm not gonna do that that's not what we're about here and if if you if this kind of stuff you can't handle people talking about this kind of thing then we might not be the channel for you or you might just have to mute this video and watch the next one because we talk about a lot of different things <laughs> You know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The ultimate ignorance is the rejection of something you know nothing about, yet refuse to investigate it. Uh, where can people find your information if they want to go get into? Because you do put out some serious research. I mean, yeah, uh, I most of the it, it's very serious. I mean, you do your homework. Uh, where can they find your information? Okay, uh, two easy ways to find it. Uh, let's just do the YouTube one because everybody knows YouTube. If you're on YouTube, just type in three words: flat. Earth Clues. Uh, those three words, you will find my stuff. My YouTube channel is just my name, Mark K. Sargent. You don't have to remember that. Flat Earth Clues, easy to remember. Uh, if you want just a dedicated website on it, which mirrors a lot of the stuff from YouTube, that's enclosedworld.com. It's still pretty cool. Uh, there are apps out there, for Flat Earth Clues apps. There is a book on Amazon now called Flat Earth Clues, which I, you know, it, it, I didn't even have to solicit. That shows you how weird it's getting. And uh, yeah, that's that's the easiest way to get all this stuff. Oh, and I do I do a show on Tuesday nights. I do a radio show called um, on Truth Frequency Re um, Network Radio called um, Strange World, and I do another show, with Patricia Steer, called Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes. That's on YouTube. There's all sorts of stuff, so cool. it's not that's tough. A, to find. That's whoa, that's whoa. fun to listen to you guys on that show. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, we have your, we have a lot of fun. Links, I'll put your links in the description too, so people can go check it out. But we definitely appreciate you coming, and I want to tell our guests as well. Thank you for those of you that joined the chat. Uh, for those of you that like to know more about the shows we do, or or just get a reminder when we do them, make sure you sign the uh, the if you go to the if you go to the page that's in the description or underneath it there's a you can sign up for the newsletter and we just send out a reminder right before the show and sometimes just about new information we got but then you can we don't spam people by any means we just, if we have a live show we post it out there and uh, you guys can come and I know a lot of the listeners that 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 rely on that newsletter so they can figure out what's going on so make sure you guys sign up for that um, that way you'll never miss a show um, you know, I always have people, man, I missed the show. How can I, you know, figure it out? That's the way you can figure it out. You just go and you sign the sign up for it. We boost it out. I want to thank Mark uh, so much for coming on, man. It was an awesome show. It was really informative, and I, you know, man, it takes me one step closer towards that. Mark, I'm gonna have to go out. Me and Rob had talked about getting a boat and going to the Chicago area and actually keeping the camcorder on it the whole entire time, so people can't say it's a mirage. Because if it's a mirage, 
the closer you get, it's going to disappear. So we're going to, you know, try to do that probably John too. And we'll document it and just check out some stuff for ourselves that we can check out. There's stuff you can do out there in the audience to check it out for yourself. None of these tests are, uh, too difficult. I mean, unless you got some kind of jet you want to let us borrow, and we can fly up in the air, see how high we can get. Nice. Uh, we, we'll do that too if you want to. If you if you guys have anything like that, so you never know who might be listening. So we maybe you never know. I know in our household it was a hot topic. We were talking to Mark Sargent today. I know uh, <laughs> we were geeking out almost all day over it. So it's really good to have you on the show. Thanks, man. Thank you very really much. Cool. It was a, it was a joy to be here. You guys were great. All right, well, blessings, everybody, and until next time, uh, we will be praying for you, and thank you so much. We love you guys. You guys are like the fam like our family. Everybody listens to the show, and we appreciate all your comments, your messages, and uh, we can't wait till next time. Read your scripture. Oh, do I have a closing remark? <laughs>